everyone, welcome to the Wool and Spinning Podcast. My name is Rachel and I can be found pretty much everywhere as well for pearls. Show notes for this episode can be found at wellforpearls.com and I'm coming to you from just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada where I live with my husband, two kids and two golden retrievers. This is episode 14, Getting Started with Sampling, and as you have probably gleaned, this is an ep- extra episode. It is coming out a week early because the show is just getting too long. My plan for this year was to keep the shows under an hour, and that is certainly not what's been happening. So this is an extra episode uh, to show you how I sample my fiber when I first start with it and also how I create my spinner's control cards. So I hope that this segment that I filmed a couple of days ago is helpful. If you have any questions or you want to continue the conversation, please head over to the Ravelry group, which is the the Woolen Spinning Podcast um, group. Uh, And also, for those of you who are spindle spinners, please share in the episode thread how you uh, sample and how you create your cards for sampling when you're spindle spinning. That would be very helpful. There's a lot of spindle spinners in the group. And um, my if I could have like a mission statement for the podcast, it would be, you know, learning and building community. And that is one way that we can build community is to show each other what we do and how we sample and how we um, build our control cards for spinning for consistency. Uh, Take pictures, share them in the episode thread, and I think some others will find that very helpful. So uh, first up is the tips and tech segment for um, sampling and the control card. Um, After that, I'll be back very briefly to talk about my works in progress and a little bit of housekeeping, and then I will say goodbye until next week. So I hope you enjoy the segment. Like I said, any questions, please um, head over to the Ravelry group and me or someone else will answer them. Okay, so this is how I sample and how I build my control cards. I am sitting here at my Lendrum, which is my generally my wheel that I go to to sample. And the reason for that is I have three um, pulleys or whirl ratios, uh, drive ratios, lots of people call these different things, but basically they're pulleys and they just change um, how many times your flyer turns in relation to your drive wheel. So I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. This is also answering a couple of questions out of the what are you curious about thread. People had some questions about how to um, get started with whirl ratios and this is a great place to start. I've got fiber all over me because I was um, drum carding earlier. So the way that I start my process to build my spinner's control card, which I'm going to show you how to do, excuse me one sec, (coughs) sorry about that, is first to prep my fiber. So for this uh, particular project, this is for the fiber to finish object um, spin along, knit along. I started off with this, which is um, some comb top. It is a um, colorway that has a lot of very analogous colors, but it has these hits of neon greeny yellow and also this really dark chestnut brown, which is really, really pretty. Um, but I knew that if I spun this as a traditional two ply or a traditional three ply, it would just be really marled and lots of barber pulling and um, I want to knit the canopy shawl by Melody of the Mandarin's podcast out of this yarn and this is not going to work. So I decided to get on my drum carter and I made a whole bunch of little bats, little nests of fiber by blending um, all of the colors together on my drum carter and I created these little nests of fiber. So now my then after I've now that I've prepped my fiber I need to go about sampling so how do I do that so this is a bit thick it's a bit wide for me so I'm actually just going to strip it down one more time how much I sample depends on what my results of my initial sampling is Um, if I really like my first sample I generally will leave it as is If I'm worried about the knitted fabric, I will sample some more so that I can knit a big swatch and a big sample. Um, I'm doing that with my Clun Forest, which I will show on the show, and I did that with my Falkland. So I pre-drafted this because um, it's just really feathery and flyaway, and it's just going to create really beautiful yarn, and so I just wanted to draft it out a little bit more. 
um, so that when I'm spinning it, hopefully it'll spin like butter. And like I said, this is BFL and silk. So um, yeah, it's just a really nice um, blend. Okay, so the next thing that I do is I think about the actual fiber content itself. So BFL has very, very low crimps per inch. If you looked at BFL in a lock structure, um, it's got kind of a curly Q sort of look to it. It's not um, wavy like this, like a Merino or a Polworth, um, uh, what other, Falkland, all of those fine fibers, they have really a lot of crimp and it looks like this. It's like wavy lines. BFL is more curly Q. Um, the longer the wools, the more curly Q they get, and you might only have one or two uh, crimps or curly Qs per inch. BFL is sort of on average three to five curly Qs per inch. So I know that I want to keep my whirl ratio, my pulley, a little bit lower. Um, BFL is kind of one of those funny fibers that you can create very ropey, um, very unpleasant yarn quite quickly. So that's why I like to drum card it. It adds a lot of air into it. There was an article by Abby Frankmont years ago on her blog that uh, she spun BFL three different ways and the woolen prep spinning worsted uh, was the prep that created a lovely um, yarn and not a ropey yarn like can sometimes happen with BFL. I have a hole in my, I have a knot in my leader. That's odd. I use really long leaders because um, it's a tip from Beth Smith that I picked up in an interview by her. Um, when you're plying, if you have a really super long leader um, and you're constantly pulling from your, your back to ply, you're plying like this, when you come up to the end of your fiber, the end of your fiber when you're plying, the single will come right up into your hand here so that when you pull forward, you'll actually have leader and you'll know that you're done. And um, it was just sort of a tip that she had to make plying and finishing your yarns a little bit easier. And I just really like it. So hence the really super long leader. Um, I think mine are generally about, oh, I don't know. Let me see. Mm, probably five feet. All right, so let me get my uptake going. I sort of know with the Lendrum uh, what uptake I like. I, I tend to start sampling by spinning a default yarn and that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I am on my 8 to 1. Yes, 8 to 1. This is 10 to 1 and 6 to 1. So if I say anything wrong uh, as the segment goes on, this is uh, 8 to 1 and this is actually my favorite whirl ratio for um, most of my BFL type spinning. BFL is one of my absolute most favorite fibers to spin. So this is how I start sampling. So I start trying different things. So I, I know that I want a two ply. Um, I know that I want a yarn suited to doing some cable work because the canopy shawl has some twisted stitches in it. So I start with my default yarn. And so that is one treadle per draft. So um, every time my right foot goes down, I'm drafting a short backward draw. And that will give me eight twists per inch. So I've probably got enough on there now. So then I pull it out and I do a ply back test. And I look at the yarn. So this is a little bit thick for what I want. Um, this is probably the equivalent of sort of a, um, it'll plump up so it'll probably be like a worsted weight. It's a little bit too low uh, twist for what I want. I want something a little bit firmer. So um, a little bit more of a higher twist. So what I'm going to do, instead of making any major adjustments, I'm actually going to decrease my tension a little bit. So I'm not, instead of changing my whirl ratio right away, I'm going to change my tension. I'm going to decrease it ever so slightly so that I have more time to pull back and draft out of the drafting zone. And my yarn 
magically just gets thinner. The other thing that I want, I can see that this isn't high enough twist, so I'm going to feed that in, and I can see that this isn't, this is getting closer to what I want. Absolutely, this is probably what I want my finished yarn to look like, but we we know that some of the ply twist that we put into our yarns is going to dissolve in water when we finish our yarns. So I am going to go down to my 10 to 1 whirl ratio. This is my 6 to 1, 8 to 1, 10 to 1. I told you them in opposites earlier, I'm sorry. Bigger whirl, smaller the number. Uh, smaller the whirl, larger the number. So this is my 10 to 1. So I'm going to go down. I'm going to leave my uptake the same. And I'm going to draft back. I'm doing a short backward draw just because I really like short backwards draw with um, spinning from sort of a semi-woolen prep. So every time my right foot goes down, I'm drafting back. Right foot goes down, I'm drafting back. Right foot goes down, drafting back. Right foot, drafting back. Right foot, drafting back. And you'll get faster at this as you practice. I'm going really slow because I'm talking. <laughs> um, I do this on autopilot. If I wanted a thicker yarn, I would increase my tension and I wouldn't change my hands at all. That's something I should have said. I'm not changing my hands at all. I'm just um, allowing the twist into the fiber supply more. So by doing that, um, when your uptake is lighter, you're allowing, um, you're basically allowing more twist into your fiber supply when your uptake is is higher and it pulls more of the yarn into the drafting zone whereas when your uptake is lower you're allowing the same amount of twist in but it's not pulling more yarn so when you draft back you're actually drafting fewer fibers i hope that makes sense um it's very difficult until you start sitting at the wheel and sampling it's very difficult to get sort of your your head wrapped around some of this stuff. The key is to get to a point where your feet and your hands are on autopilot and the tweaks that you make on your wheel create the yarns that you want. So that your hands and your feet actually don't really change very much. Okay. So I've done quite a bit. I'm going to wind that in and I'm going to pull off and I'm going to apply back and see what I've got. So this is a yarn that I want. This is exactly what I want. So this is a lovely twist. Um, it's light and airy. Um, my twist angle is about 45 degrees and when I apply it, I'll actually tighten it up a little bit more so that when it when it's washed, it relaxes a little bit. My single is even. Um, you, it's hard to see because the camera's way up there, but I'll put the card, the sample card under, and then you can see a little bit better maybe. Um, that, that single is, is um, very consistent. It's exactly the thickness that I want, and then it makes this really lovely um, yarn. I'm sorry that it's hard to see, but I'll show you um, what my sample looks like um, in the, when we go back to the regular um, format of the show. So basically, I am going to continue spinning this way until I finish all of this little nest. And then I will show you what I do next. So I'm going to do that and then I'll be back and I'll show you what I do next. Okay, so I've spun my sample and what I'm going to do now is let my tension off and I'm going to make a plying bracelet. I'm not going to show you how to do that because there are lots of tutorials online um, to do um, plying bracelets. You can Google, um, that's one spot where my single wasn't strong enough, so I'll have to make a note to myself to uh, make sure my fiber is twist locked when I'm spinning. So yeah, there's lots of tutorials online for Andy and plying bracelets, plying bracelet. Um, there's video tutorials, um, tons of stuff. There's lots of different ways to do them. Um, you need to figure out what works for you and what you like. So this is a great technique to use for when you are 
doing a two ply sample. Um, my only word of caution, and this might happen because this is quite a big sample, is don't um, wind off too much because and have a too big of a sample because you will get tangled and you will end up with a dog's breakfast on your hand. And don't wind it too tightly because your middle finger will start to lose circulation <laughs> and that's no fun. All right, so before I start my plying bracelet, what I do is I actually take some of my singles. I just need to grab some scissors. Sorry for the crack, the uh, crackling. All right, and I take my sample card and I cut a hole or a, like a, well, you know that and I actually wind off some of my singles onto the card so that I can see what my singles look like. All right, and then, and I have to keep in mind the first, um, I need to redo this leader, it's all knotted. The first, um, and remember you're applying in the opposite direction that you spun, so you now we're going the S twist direction or the anti-clockwise to the left. I have to redo my leader anyhow. All right, so for plying, remember that the beginning of your single was where we were trying a whole bunch of different stuff. So it's not gonna be true of what your finished yarn is gonna look like, but after the first like half yard or so, it's gonna be pretty indicative. So I'm doing one, two, three treadles wind on. Two, three, wind on, two, three, wind on. So my single broke here. Like I said, you can end up with a real dog's breakfast if you're not careful. I know some people really love bracelet plying and some people really hate it. I'm kind of on the fence. It serves a purpose for me, but I don't love it. Um, if you want to do, if you're sampling for a three ply, um, I often will Navajo ply my samples just to get an idea of what my three ply might look like um, rather than going to all the effort of spinning three separate bobbins and spinning three. Navajo plied yarn is will be a little bit different than your actual finished traditional three ply and if you're submitting the yarn for um, an assignment for like the master spinner program that would not fly but for me and my purposes and being a hobbyist and doing this at home and doing it for fun that's more than adequate for me. Really what you need is your singles because you need to know what you're spinning to for your singles for when you're spinning. And then you need a sample of your what your yarn looks like plied so that when you do your ply back tests as you're spinning for consistency, you can see, okay, yeah, I'm on, I'm on track. I really like this yarn. I love how the colors blended so beautifully. I tend to keep my um, uptake when I'm plying a little bit lower. Um, it means my single, my my plied yarn can sometimes kind of it doesn't go right away, but I find um, it gives me a more even yarn. So 
So before you pull back for your control card to finish it off, make sure you wind your yarn all the way into, into and onto your bobbin because you want it to be really consistent. There's still twist being added all the way through here. Um, until the yarn actually winds onto the bobbin, there's twist being put into your yarns at all times. So just be aware of that. To get a really accurate sample, you need to make sure you're winding the whole way on. So then what I do, and I never used to do this, but I do now. I cut more holes in my card. So my card gets quite full, as you can see. And that is my sample of my unwashed plied yarn. So I have my singles on your left there, and then I have my sample of my unwashed plied yarn. And then what I do is I go to my box of tricks. And I pull out my sampling Nitty Naughty. This is a wonderful tool for those who don't have one. I use it all the time. It was worth every penny. Uh, they sometimes come up on the um, Spinner's Marketplace secondhand. Um, you can make one out of PVC pipe. Uh, most of the sampling Nitty Naughties are about a yard around. Um, yeah, I just really like it. It was definitely one of those things that was a, a, a great tool to add to my arsenal. All right, so then what I do is I tie my skein and that will give me my sample. So I'll do that really quickly just so you guys can see what the sample looks like when it's done. And then I, what I do next is I actually go and wash it and I will keep it with my spinning project, which you guys have seen. Uh, if you've been with me for a while or watched the show for a while, um, you will have seen that I keep my washed sample with my project throughout the spinning process. And if I'm concerned for this, um, for the canopy shawl, I'm not worried about whether or not um, I'm gonna like the knitted fabric. I can see that the blending the uh, colors and doing that work on my drum carter was really, um, really created the um, more analogous color that I was looking for. So I'm not going to do a um, knitted sample because I don't need my gauge. I just need a, con a consistent yarn, which I can do by ensuring that I have my singles, which I do, to compare against as I'm spinning. So if I was doing a sweater or something where the gauge really mattered, um, and I've shown you my Falkland sample and my Falkland knitted sweat swatch and I've shown you uh, I don't know if I've shown you my clan forest from year from eons ago I will show that to you guys um, I did spin a big enough sample so that I could swatch that so that is my sample and I will wash that and I will keep it with my project for the remainder of my spinning but I will use my singles on my um, spinners control card to ensure that I'm remaining consistent throughout the spinning process and because I am going to get up and walk away from my wheel because it's almost dinner time I take the time immediately to write down the tool that I was using, which was my Lendrum double treadle. I used my regular flyer at 10 to 1. Light take up, which is my tension. So that was the adjustment that I did back here. I had very light take up. And so that, my dear friends, is how I create my spinner's control card. 
and that's what I'll use for the remainder of my project to actually do the spinning. And when I am finished the spinning, once I am done with the spinning and I've washed the finished yarn and I've skeined it and everything, I will put uh, down here where this empty spot is, I will put my finished, my final yardage, how much it weighs, the grist, which is my yards per pound, my twist angle, and my twists per inch. And that's how I will finish my control card so that if I ever wanna create this particular yarn ever again, I will be able to. And I will also put on the back how I prepped the fiber. So I will probably write back here um, that I drum carded it. Uh, I put it through the drum carder twice and then I divided it down and made little uh, nests that were about a third of an ounce. So that's how I sample. And um, I really hope that that was helpful and I really hope that that will get a lot of you guys who are um, uh, starting to sample um, started. So I will see you back in just a minute. So I hope that was helpful. Um, for those of you who are wanting to see the control card a little bit more closely and in a little bit more detail, this is what how I created it and this is what was on it. So um, I hope that that is helpful. Come on, focus. And that is what the yarn, those are my singles and that is my plaid yarn. And I hope that that is helpful. And that is what I use to control my spinning while I'm spinning. And actually my sample is dry um, and I left it over there. So I will show it to you next week. Um, I'm going to move on to other things because I have a few things that I'm working on and I thought I would show you really quickly. One of them is my thick and thin that I've been working on and if you follow me on Instagram, um, I'm on there as well for pearls, uh, you will have seen my um, attempts at the wheel and also a couple of videos of how I was figuring out the mechanics. I had done a little sample skein of the thick and thin and uh, this was some fiber that I had in my stash from eons ago and I think it's wool of the Andes and it, it's really 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 fly away and I think I'm going to card the rest of it up and blend it with some other stuff um, but that was actually how I got my sort of the technique down so this was my little sample I thwacked it washed it did the whole thing and uh, it actually turned out really well it hasn't fallen apart which is pretty amazing um, it's not particularly thick um, that definitely took some practice doing the big braid of fiber and that's actually drying and hopefully it'll be I'll be able to show it to you next week so that's one thing I've been working on the biggest thing with learning how to do thick and thin for me was figuring out the, the hand mechanics um, and once I got it it was like oh this is so easy but it was the hand mechanics it wasn't like it just clicked right away or something so that is something I've been working on the other thing that I've been working on is my Polworth and silk this was a sweet Georgie yarns braid that was um, from the seconds wall at the studio um, it spun up like this and you'll recognize it immediately. I was working on it uh, back in December, November and December, and I kind of burned out on it. And um, it turned out really nicely. This was um, the Cloud Break colorway, but because of it being seconds, it um, was very gray and washed out looking. Um, the blues didn't really pop. The gray wasn't true gray. It almost had kind of a washed out feel to it, which would be lovely. Um, but I think if I was going to go back and do it again, I would have <laughs> blended it all on the drum carter and created um, something that was truly blended before I started spinning. Um, I got a lovely yarn and I got a beautiful, um, huge 882 yards or something skein. Uh, but the colors just weren't it was still too variegated and I knew that it would be a problem um, and what I wanted to knit with this and what I spun for was Maria Monska's succulent shawl and this is a beautiful design it's quite intricate lace and um, it's just got a really lovely feel it kind of reminds me a little bit of um, 
The Shaylin Shawl by uh, Layla Rab. But when I started knitting it, my plan was to knit the whole thing and then over dye it. But when I started knitting, this is what it looked like. I just, I couldn't stand it. It was just driving me bonkers. And I'm not gonna hold it too close because the colors will blow up. But basically what was happening was you can see that striping. And the striping was so dark that the white part just looked horrible. Um, it made the white part that was a beautiful mauve color almost look like it had had yarn bleed onto it and I just I couldn't handle knitting it and then there was barber polling and marling so I knew I was gonna have to dye it because of what I wanted to knit with it because of what I had designed the yarn to do but I just couldn't knit the whole thing and risk I just I had to rip it out <laughs> um, so I did a test skein I wound some off and I dyed it with some cobalt blue. And it was a little bit too uh, denim -y for me. It wasn't quite the right color. And um, yeah, it just was, wasn't was saturated enough. Um, and so I decided to go quite a bit darker. I didn't do another sample because I knew when I saw this, I knew exactly what I wanted. So I, I over dyed it. So I dyed it with 50-50 um, black, oh, sorry, my hands, 50-50 uh, black and cobalt. Sorry, the light is right there to give me good light for tonight. So that's actually the right color. And um, the neat thing is, is that the dark, the original dark parts of the yarn were preserved. They're still darker. And the light part of the yarn is actually still a bit lighter but when it knits up it'll just look like a very very subtle tonal so this I broke the skein into two 400 yard skeins instead of having to deal with one 800 yard skein so this is the first one it's done I'm gonna wind it into a cake and I'm gonna recast on hopefully tomorrow night and the other one I don't know why but it's still wet and it's here and uh, it, the yarn is still fine. It still looks exactly the same. That's not a dye spot. That's dog hair. <laughs> uh, long haired dogs. I do not recommend them if you're into yarn. So this um, skein isn't quite dry, but like I said, the yarn still looks exactly the same. It's just a little bit more solid in color now. And uh, I don't know if that's going to focus very well. Yeah, and I just really, really like it. So um, this will dry and I'll be able to um, cake it up when I'm ready for it. Um, so actually, I'm really happy with how that turned out. I did feel like I needed to go to quite a, a much darker color to cover up all of that variegation and all of that striping. Um, the funny thing is, is that I'm actually wearing, so this is my Multnomah shawl. This was um, Hedgehog Fibers. 50-50 uh, merino and silk and this was my this was hand spun um, I bought this at a local yarn shop the fiber and I spun it and then I Navajo plied it it's striped and it's beaded as well um, I don't know if you can see from back there the beading there you go this is um, Kate who designed this Kate Ray she's the host of the stitch addiction podcast which is a great podcast if you don't watch it she actually said she hadn't seen one beaded before um, and I think I showed this on an episode back. Oh, it was back in the spring, probably. It was like a year ago, almost. Anyways, um, I love this shawl. But it's striped. But it's garter stitch. And it's very muted. And it's very... Um, there's no... There's a little bit of white, but for the most part, it's not startling white and blue. Um, and I think that's why this works. Versus the Polruth and Silk, it just... I knew it wasn't going to work, but it like really didn't work. So hence the ripping it out and over dyeing it before I got to the knitting. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy with that. And that is something that I worked on on the weekend. The last thing is my Cheviot socks. So this was, and I don't think, was this plied last week or had I just plied it? I'm not totally sure. This, I've already caked it up. This is my two ply Cheviot high twist. Um, 
this came up beautifully. I have written quite an extensive blog post about this that's going to come live in the next uh, week or so. Um, so I'm not going to talk too too much about this, but it, it was designed for socks. This was my plan and uh, I just love how it's knitting up. It's just, oh, those are the colors. It's so cool. So that's the start of the first one. And uh, yeah, very subtle. I dyed this fiber myself and um, uh, yeah, spun it super high twist on the Hanson um, and then plied it in double drive on my matchless. I'm finding it very difficult to ply really high twist yarns on the Wooly Winder on the Hanson because it pulls so hard. And even with very little or no tension, it still pulls. Um, so I found more and more recently, I'm going back to plying on my wheels. And uh, I have had a few private conversations about the Hanson with people. I am happy to answer questions privately with anybody um, if you are wondering about the Hanson. Um, but again, this is, was spun on my jumbo flyer on the Hanson and then I applied it in double drive on my matchless. So that worked out really well. Super high twist. It's a little bit unpleasant to work with. That's what I was hoping for so that it would increase the durability. And like I said, there will be a blog post about these and hopefully I'll have more progress on them next week. I'm hoping to get to the heels on both socks by next week. So I will show you my progress and then I will keep you posted about the big question. Can I machine wash them? That is the key. So this was my spinner's control card for these. And that was my finished yarn and finished specs. And I had actually hoped for a higher twist angle. I was hoping for more like 45 degrees. Um, but for whatever reason, that's not kind of how it worked out. So, yeah. That is those. And I'm knitting those on 2.25 millimeter needles. I have no idea what that is in the US sizes, but it doesn't really matter because it's hand spun and we all need different needle sizes for a hand spun. Um, so I'm knitting them quite tightly. I knit my, uh, these ones, my Smith & You socks, they were high twist and I knit them on 2.25s. They were a little bit unpleasant to knit, same as these. High twist, uh, slightly coarser, stiffer yarn, and um, they are, washing and wearing like you wouldn't believe they're just they've been awesome so i um i think that for me is the uh ticket high twist almost to the point of being unpleasant to knit with and it doesn't seem to matter whether i go with a two ply or a three ply so fingers crossed that is my like recipe so the last thing was i had a question in I can't remember if it was in the episode thread or in the what are you curious about thread, but last show I showed my core spun that I've been working on. So this was my core spun, my first sample, and this was a bat that I made. It was my very first bat that I ever made, and I kind of stashed it because I wanted to keep it because I felt like it was really special. And then I decided this year that I was going to turn over a new leaf and I wasn't going to save stuff just because I felt like it was special. I was going to start working with my stuff for the joy of creating with it. And I talk about that in my blog post, um, the, my Snow Qualmy story, Snow Qualmy story uh, blog post, which was posted on Monday, January 18th. I'll link to it in the show notes. But I talk a little bit about like not being afraid to create with stuff that I feel like I'm saving or that's special. So this was the result of that. But I had mentioned last show that the core spun yarn was different from the same same bat but wool uh, yarn that was spun semi woolen and this was a two ply and this was what I did originally with the bat. So this is quite a bit more um, fuzzy. Um, it's very sparkly. It's a little bit what I would call a little bit brighter, but it's quite matte. Not the not the fire star, but the um, yarn itself is quite matte. Whereas when you put these two together, the core spun is a little bit brighter, and uh, it's not as fuzzy. Um, it's not as sparkly. The fire star got really like wrapped in the core spun, so it's not as sparkly. Like you can even see the sparkle in the light. Um, 
but they're definitely different yarns. So that is what, same bat, two different ways of spinning it, core spun and a two ply woolen sample. So I hope that answers your question. And I can't remember who asked that, but that is, um, those are my results. I think that's it for today. So I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I will chat with you again next week. And until then, happy spinning.